Are there any dreamers in the room? Yes. yes. God, I honestly thought nobody was going to talk back to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm away now. I have dreams all the time. I don't look anything like Dr. King, but I have dreams all the time. And to get to the point of this talk, I've got to talk you through some of the dreams that brought me to wherever I am now. I've got no idea where I'm going, but I've only got to where I am because I have dreamed all the time. And the first dream, I'm going to take you right back 40 years to when I was a wee girl and I was eight years old and I was sitting in the salubrious surroundings of Grange Academy Kilmarnock Assembly Hall and I was watching the most inspirational teacher I have ever met, who is my dad. And he was leading this group of incredible teenagers who are now in their 50s now, late 50s. And I can remember their names and faces as if it was yesterday. And they were creating music, creating this community in this school hall in the 70s, music that went from Oklahoma to the Hallelujah Chorus and Annie Get Your Gun to Zadok the Priest and it was phenomenal and I watched that as a wee girl and there was something in that that made me know I wanted to do that not be up there because I don't like this <laughs> really don't but I really wanted to do what he was doing it's the control freak thing <laughs> it really is but I wanted to be able to do what he did but I wanted to do it in Granger Academy dream number one fast forward 15 years I got it Crazy. My dad retired, he was ill, and I was applying for promoted posts at that point, and by chance, by luck, by nepotism, I don't really care. I got that job. I got it. And I spent the next two years, from 23 to 25, proving that I could do everything that he did. I did my very best to recreate everything he did and try and recreate that feeling of community that he had started, that he had created this incredible heritage of music. And the greatest compliment I got at the end of that two years was, oh, you're just like your feather in a skirt. <laughs> Cheers. But I think you'll find he didn't wear heels once. <laughs> so, Grange Academy back in the day, they've got a beautiful new school now. Back in the day, it was a wee bit like Beirut in East Ayrshire. It was a big, grey, concrete box, but it, it didn't matter. It wasn't the place, it was the people. And it has always been about the people. And every day, every school day, we would cram into a classroom, generally F2, and Joss will remember this because she was one of them, and we would cram into that classroom and we would sing. 50, 60, 70, sometimes more kids. It was so illegal, it was brilliant. You would cram yourself in there and it smelt hellish. And it was so hot and you had the windows open, you had the smokers outside and they were flinging the fagged outs in. You were flinging them back with cheery, cheery banter. It was fantastic. However, sometimes a really interesting thing would happen. And the really interesting thing that would happen was that the people with their faces crammed in the window outside looking in at the big body of the kirk inside, having a great time singing and laughing and smiling, some of them would disengage from the group outside and they would make their way up a good hundred yards and along and come in the classroom or come and stand at the classroom door. The classroom door was always open to let the smell out. <laughs> but the classroom door was open and these people would sometimes stand, these kids would stand at the door and they would watch the rehearsal. You could not at any point say hello because they'd bolt. Don't do that. You just don't. You just acknowledge that they're there. We wink can you just keep going. Over weeks, days, sometimes that very day, they'd sidle in and there was always a table at the door. I always kept a table at the door that they could just come in and sit. It was like a wee wild cat. And they would come and they would sit. And it was just as hard for them to come in that door as it was for the body of the kirk, the choir kids, to let them in. Because in many cases, these kids that were coming to the choir were coming to the choir to get away for these wings. You know? Very, very strange. But this was for, for many kids the very first time that some of these young folks had actually done something positive in the context of the school. And in some cases, it was the chance for them to actually show they could engage with the, the, the big body of the kirk, as I keep calling it. Now, whilst this was going on, there was a musical that came out that resonated with me. I'm a complete music theatre geek. I always have been. And it was a musical called Les Mis. Most of you will know about it. And I would go up and down to London and up to London as much as I possibly could. I had a good salary then. It was great. I was a teacher. <laughs> so I went down and I saw this show and I loved this show. It was amazing. It was amazing. You had the set that went round about and it went up and down and there were amazing, amazing characters. But the, char the, the character that was, that was the most powerful for me was the character of Jean Valjean and the story of crime and punishment and rehabilitation and ultimately redemption. This story was just incredible and I didn't realise how much that story was going to resonate with me as I actually went through my own journey. So, dream number two was starting to formulate. I didn't realise 
And it was to put on Les Mis, that's a stupid dream, because as those of you involved in any form of theatre will know you need licences, it's an absolute nightmare, and that was never going to happen because the show was on in London. But put it at the back of my mind and moved on. Back to Grange, happy, happy days. Then the fates started moving again, as they tend to do. And a young guy joined my department, a guy called Paul Matheson. And he came in with a, an absolute passion for the technical side of theatre. And all of a sudden, what he was able to create replicated what we were doing musically. So the quality of the production reflected back the quality of uh, the, the music. And it just created this amazing thing. But the best thing about it was that the team that he created to make that magic happen were the team grown from people with their faces pressed up against the window. They were the ones who didn't have the confidence to maybe come in and do effectively the jazz hands, but they were the ones who were desperate to be part of it, but happy to be in the dark. And then something else magical happened. The license for Les Mis was released as a school's edition. Couldn't believe it. I applied for it and we got it and we were granted the Scottish premiere performances back in 2002, 2003. And we were able to stage 13 sold out performances of Les Mis in Grange Academy, Kilmarnock. That's just nuts. That shouldn't have happened, but it did and it was magical. But one of the saddest things, and there's, there's people in here who I know are teachers and lecturers, one of the saddest things for me as a teacher was the fact that you invested six years in teaching wonderful, wonderful young people and then they leave and you don't see them again or very, very rarely do you see them again. What if we could build a place where absolutely anybody could come and be part of what we did and it wouldn't matter about their age, it wouldn't matter about their background, it wouldn't matter about their ability, they didn't need to be any good at all, they just wanted to be part of a community that was based in a, in a theatrical environment. Well, that's a great plan, let's do that. So no one told you life was going to be this way, your life's a joke, you're broke, yes you are. I knew at that stage it was not a good feeling. I was starting to not fit in. The way the system was going, I wasn't fitting in because my methodology at the time, and I don't care what it's like now, but my methodology was not fitting in. And I knew that the day was going to come when I was going to be a, really an outsider looking in. And I saw a device from a senior colleague and I, and I told him how I was feeling and I respected him very much. And he said something that resonated very strongly with me. And he said to me, Fiona, one of the reasons that you're leaving is not that you can't fit in the box, it's that you won't. I did not know until that moment in my life that there was a box and that I was being put in the damn box. <laughs> now, if they were trying to put me in the box, what, were they, what was happening to the kids who had their faces pressed against the window? You know, and that, that was a great release for me. So we, we and, and Paul Matheson, the guy I was talking about, who was in my department at the time, we decided we would leave at the same time and we would try and build this place. So here's the scenario. We've resigned because we're stupid. We've taken on a 25-year lease. Lease, because we're stupid. And we're <laughs> teachers, and we know damn all about business. And it's going to cost quarter of a million pounds to convert it. <laughs> Idiots. So round about the banks we go, and eventually, in desperation, we went back to the original bank, and I met a wonderful woman called June Ross. And I will never forget this woman to the day I die. And we went back to her and said, please let us pitch again to you, well, to, to that bank. And she was assigned to us. And by chance or not, she had come to see Les Mis at the Grange. She had no connection to us whatsoever, but because she came to Les Mis at the Grange, she understood what we had achieved there, but she, more importantly, she saw what we were hoping to achieve in, in the wider community. So she said, yes, we will lend you the money, secured against everything you own, stupid. When I write my book, it'll be how not to start a business. And we were off, it was amazing. So we built this place. And it, is, it's a, it sounds so cheesy. I love cheese. I love music theatre, cheese, and wine, by chance. <laughs> so, and where we are now is a place where everybody knows your name. It is populated and was populated in first instance by the silent majority. The silent majority who were part of the choir in first instance. The nice folk had just got on with it. They just get on with it. But you treat them as individuals. You know if Granny's no wheel. You know if the goldfish is dead. You know if the wee one's got a wobbly tooth. You know. And because of these people allowing us to continue, we're able to take that feeling of community out into areas that can't get us because of geography, finance. They don't think they're worth it. They don't think they deserve the arts or they just don't think the arts are for them. And that is an absolute tragedy. They are the people with their faces pressed up against the window. So now we're able to go into an incredible range of places. We have um, projects with, with the old folks, we have special needs, we have the offenders with ex-offenders, we have tiny wee babies, 
but the similarities are far more pronounced than the differences. It's really quite incredible. The balance of care and control is becoming skewed. We are hiding behind the labels. Wheelchair, old, off your head. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it, it really doesn't matter. We need to get back in and, and see the person and see the story behind the person. And in these sectors, I could take you to the care homes. And with, with music, you, you get to witness the most incredible stories. A lovely couple who I thought were father and daughter. But the, 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 the man was so far down the Alzheimer's route, he looked so much older than his wife. And no, no reaction between the pair of them, apart from him, her trying to, to draw him out. And I got talking to her and you find out that their song is Some Enchanted Evening. So you start playing Some Enchanted Evening and nothing happens. But the next week, you see a wee reaction. And two weeks later, they're up having a dance. They're up having a dance. The wee man who has lost the power of speech but has regressed to the first words he ever learnt. Bye-bye. 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 Full conversations just with bye-bye. But you find out that his song is on the street where you live. And you play that, and he can mouth those words the whole way through, and then goes back to bye-bye. A wee couple that come every week to Musical Generations, and the husband has a terminal cancer, and the wife has advanced dementia, and they hold hands every week and sing to each other, when I fall in love. Now, you cannot, you can't buy that kind of experience. The wee boy who is a wee roaster, I was going to say another word, but he's a wee roaster, and he comes <laughs> and he helps every week at that same project. Now, he hates the school. But that wee boy goes round these old folk and he dances with them and he leads the conga line of Zimmers when we play the Happy Wanderer. <laughs> but most importantly, that wee boy will stand at the microphone and he will stand every week and sing from memory the song he knows the whole way through. He sings Caledonia. He sings Caledonia from start to finish. And it's fine and he's great and he's loving it and everybody's loving it, but it gets closer to the end of the song and his face starts to change. Why is his face starting to change? Because he knows at the end of the song, he's going to get the applause and it gets to the end of the song and the applause starts and the wee face just lights up. Now that wee boy is like a, is like a mildly criminal meerkat. You know, he's, 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 he's off for that. You know, he needs channeling. He needs to be channeled, you know. But he's got so much to offer. He's got so much potential and he's got so much to give and he loves the, pra the praise, the, he loves the applause. You take that wee boy and you grow him up and you put him in the prison. And you get the same wee boy growing up as a man coming back after his very, very first performance. And it was a hell of a job getting them to stand up and sing in front of other prisoners. But they stand up and they sing and it gets then the applause come. And up comes this guy, 23 years old, on life scrap heap. And he doesn't care where to put himself. And he says, Fiona, what's, what's this feeling? What, what, what is this? I said, I don't know, go on. Where you go? And he says, I, I know what it is. It's a legal high. <laughs> Yes, it's a legal high. And would it not be a hell of a lot giving folk a legal high for singing and dancing than for injecting and swallowing it? Just saying. <laughs> so we're not going to put GlaxoSmithKline out of business, but you know, it might save the NHS a wee bit of money as we move, as we move on. And then something inside so strong, a song I love and a song that resonates really, really powerfully with me. And it's a song we sing every week in the prison classroom and the guys know it by heart now. And they sing it and they sing it as they look out of a window that has got bars three inches apart the whole time. And imagine singing, looking at a window with bars, just think about it, it's horrific. Anybody says it's a holiday camp, it needs to go and try it. And they sing that song. And I think it's absolutely heartbreaking because these guys are the same guys who had their faces against the window back at the school and that's for real because I'm now teaching boys in jail who I taught for real at school. So the two worlds have collided absolutely hideously for me because I have no pride in thinking, oh well look where you've ended up. It's the inevitability of those faces at the window who have been moved along and moved along and nobody's listening and nobody's putting their hand out and saying, moon then. They've ended up in there to my shame. They've ended up in there what do we do? We have to help. You have to put your hand out and help and say, can I help? Can I listen? Because in so many cases, it's not about the music with our projects. It's about the listening. It's about somebody listening to you, whether it's an old person or somebody in a wheelchair or somebody in the prison or just a nice person coming along for an hour for themselves. Can you help me? And it has happened to me so often in my life. Life is not a film. I love films. I love theatre more. 
because that's life. And in any show, there will be mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. That's the nature of the beast. That's the exciting thing. It's how we all cope together to get a show that people would like to pay for and come and see again and again. And life is like that. People have helped me in ways I couldn't begin to tell you over the years, but I had to ask, I had to be vulnerable enough to say, I don't have a clue here. And as a teacher, that was hard. And I didn't do it as a teacher. I did it when I moved into business. And when I moved into business, I met incredible people who would put their hand out and help me. I've met two women in particular who have been absolute visionaries and inspirational to me. Leah Gilmer, you need to look her up. Wonderful woman, Emoja Musica. She's an American woman. And she set up this organisation that believes in the power of music to transform communities. Leah Gilmer. And every time I speak to her, I remember why we do this. And business isn't about the what. Nobody cares what I do. It's why do we do it? Why do we do it? There are easier ways to make a living than why we do this. Why? Because we should. We must. We must. So, Justin Bieber. Aha. Uh -huh. Inspirational visionary. <laughs> you may mock. So, where are we going now this wee community we've got with music running through our veins? I have absolutely no idea. The past has been challenging and amazing. We're here now and now we're looking at a blank page and I'll take you back to the prison where again after a performance one of the men came up to me and said, Fiona, when I go back to my Peter, back to myself tonight, I am going to sit, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to turn over the pages in the book in my mind. And when I turn over the pages in the book in my mind, this is one of the pictures. How poetic from somebody that is in life's scrap heap. He does what I do, what you do, what we all do. We shut our eyes and we go to the happy place, the place that defines us, the place that makes us feel good, the memories. So as we move forward, I choose only to work with people who believe the why, why we must do this together. We can only do it together. People do it. Not politicians with the greatest of respect. We, they can help us, but we have to do it together. The West of Scotland tends to mock the dreamers. We must stop mocking the dreamers. We must have dreams and we must use them because they come. It's incredible. And I'll take you back and I hope you've already read the words because I'm not going to sing them and I'm not going to read them to you. Justin Bieber, absolutely fine. I love the song. I love the music. I love the words. But I love it more when I think of who actually wrote it and who actually wrote it are four ex-students of mine who now live in LA. They're called Downtown Drive. Again, look them up. And there's four young boys, 21, from Kilmarnock, and they are now writing songs for Justin Bieber that are the title songs in his album. Why are they doing that? Why? Because they believe they could. Why shouldn't they? <sighs> Risk. Who cares? <laughs> They're living the dream because they believed. So to take you back to Limas, do you hear the people sing? Somewhere beyond the barricade, is there a world you long to see? Hell yes. And it's getting closer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>